Hey, my, my name is Heath Aronson. I'm excited to be giving the keynote today on a, a subject hopefully you'll all find very interesting. It's, um, it's open source, uh, which of course uh, we all love, um, but it's a way of looking at open source a little bit differently. Um, so I work for um, the UN Foundation's Digital Impact Alliance, and we've been working uh, for the last three years to really kind of think about <clears throat> how should you know the greater UN system, uh, social good organizations, uh, large international NGOs and donors, how should they think about um, supporting open source? And really, what is the what is the promise that open source um, has um, in, in all of the kind of technical developments and, and trends that we've seen uh, in open source? How can we kind of harness those um, to you know, for social good? So I think it, it, it's a very interesting conversation because it ties together a lot of um, all of our interests. Um, it ties together you know, a passion uh, for open source, a passion for technology, but also ties into to social good. What can we do to you know, make the world a better place? Um, so we're gonna just share a little bit about uh, you know, what makes these types of software projects uh, a little bit different. Um, what makes them you know, worth supporting? Should we even support them? What does it look like? And then we'll kind of go into some details of what we as an organization have begun to do to begin to uh, maintain uh, and work towards sustainability uh, of these projects. And while you, you might be coming from an infrastructure uh, project um, or, or, or working with something kind of in the middle of a tech stack, um, this might not feel as relevant, um, but it is, it is relevant. It is very interesting. Um, and then kind of at the end, we're gonna just kind of, you know, look towards the future and say, you know, what, is it, what does it look like um, for like for governments to look at their you know their critical infrastructure not just their infrastructure but all the applications um, that they use and be able to kind of share that across you know municipal governments city governments national governments uh, internationally can we can we start to look at applications um, as open sourced shared value tools that can be um, you know through community uh, supported etc so again um, you know thanks for the opportunity to be able to to share today. Um, I'll be uh, here during the presentation uh, through the chat. Very happy to kind of address uh, questions um, as, we, as we go along. So open source software is widely used um, by governments and programs um, that are addressing the sustainable development goals. So the, the, the UN system um, uses the sustainable get development goals to kind of give us as countries a target um, for a number of objectives in international development, things that we want to see um, as being better. So open source has a lot of promise. Um, open source promises things. It, it, it says like we can build something, we can share something, we can give it, we can give it freely. And this is, a, this is, this is particularly appealing um, to those in the, in the social sector. Um, and those in government. Um, so this is the idea of public money, public code. It makes sense, it's logical. If we invest um, in, in developing new software, if that is used using taxpayer money, we're building something, it makes sense that it should not be proprietary. And if it was proprietary, who would, who would own it and who would control it? Um, so there has been, you know, for many years, um, this, this notion that, um, you know, in the public sector, we should be embracing open source. Um, and we work specifically in the international development sector um, and with international donors who are supporting, um, you know, governments and social good organizations um, and have embraced, you know, open source for many years um, because of its promise. So in this, in this program, we're going to jump back and forth between um, just looking at uh, the idea of open source um, and this term uh, digital public goods. So digital public goods is a term we've started to use in the last year or two to really kind of define kind of clearly this class of uh, open source products that, that we're talking about. Um, and it really kind of captures this idea, you know, very good of like, you know, what we are trying to create are these large shared applications that, that are a public good. And in many ways, their funding comes from public funds. Um, and so that's a word that we're going to kind of use uh, between this. Um, there's a real movement inside of the UN system to, to not only, um, you know, create, um, you know, software to accelerate uh, social change, um, but to really invest in, in, in open source. And so, you know, right up at the very top, you know, the, the UN Secretary General has you know, put out this year his roadmap for digital cooperation. 
and, and their very first recommendation was for the creation of an alliance uh, to support uh, digital public goods. Um, and so there's a number of organizations, some that we work with very uh, closely, that we collaborate with, um, that are working towards making this, uh, this a reality. Um, so we put up here on the slide a number of these digital public goods. Uh, you may recognize them, you might not, but it's definitely worth um, you know, taking a look, Googling around, uh, getting to know them. These are, you know, these are you know, outstanding projects um, that are, are doing great things. Uh, and there might be ways for you to you know, volunteer um, and contribute to them. So despite the investments uh, in open source um, in the international development sector, uh, they've struggled and they've struggled for a number of reasons. And, and so um, you know, the, the unit that I work for, the Open Source Center at the Digital Impact Alliance uh, was set up, um, you know, it was managed about five years ago, but we've been operating for about three. And it was set up just to be able to think about uh, these these problems that um, the, the the projects are struggling with, and it, you know if, if you if you think about it, there, there's it's it's intuitive why the these projects are are struggling. Um, you know the, the the starting place is they're they're big, um, they're surprisingly large. Um, very often, they're applications that were that were created for a social mission. So let's let's imagine, uh, for example, a, a, a there's a problem. A country of Ethiopia uh, needs a software system to uh, manage their immunization supply chain. You're like, great. Okay. Well, well, let's let's go and see what software kind of is ex exists out out there that could do this. And you know, like, there's nothing really off the shelf that you could take. So, like, okay, we got to build our own. Let's take some open source tools. Let's build on them. Let's create this application. And this application is for immunization supply chain. So we built it for one country. This is this is this is where the problem you know begins to start. And it was actually a pretty big investment, a pretty nice piece of software. But really, at this point, all it all it actually is is custom application, is a custom software. Um, it's been built. Um, they may slap a license onto it, but it's not documented. There's no community. It's not shared. Um, and this is this is kind of our starting point. So what's been happening is now another country comes and says we would like to. Um, also have immunization supply uh, chain software. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, to, to, to manage our product. So we got a whole other, the country of Indonesia, for example. So we want to do the same thing. So what do they do? They build it too. And then another country builds it too. So all these countries are building the same thing over and over. So there's a lack of coordination saying, you know what? We already built it over there. We already built it over there. So that's kind of a, you know, a starting point of the problem is that things are being built over and over and over. And, and I wouldn't even say that they're really open source until a community has formed and it's kind of shared widely and broadly. But because these are applications and they're very customized applications and because they need more than just technical. So in the case of immunization supply chain software, you need somebody in the country talking to the governments, helping them configure it, uh, talking to doctors and nurses and the pharmaceutical companies. And who does all that? Who owns this? Can, can, does this vision really work where we can mix the ideas of open source software with all the other things that it needs. And there's, there's no surprise that it's a problem. However, if we can solve this, if we can figure out how to you know, take all these lessons that we've learned in open source, expand them a little bit more widely to, to take on the other organizational activities that need to happen to, to make them really thrive, um, we can do some great things. And, and this is where I see um, a whole new class of products kind of coming out there that are, you know, um, that can be competitive uh, with proprietary systems, um, and that can kind of unlock, um, you know, sharing between governments. So that's what we're working on. But right now, here's the status. You know, you know, the World Bank says only 13% of public sector ICT projects in developing countries um, are successful, and most fail because of lack of money. Um, there's other problems as well, like you know, no, no real kind of community governance um, you know, can takes place for the open source project to really get going. And it's unclear who owns it. Uh, and we'll look into that a little bit uh, deeper. Um, so from our point of view, the projects um, that, our, that our, our center looks to support, um, it's very important to kind of see, you know, what, where do we kind of put our focus? And so we've basically done two things. So if you look at over to the right on the slide, uh, we have what we call foundational open source. You, you know all these projects. Um, they are used by 
all of us to, 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 to as the foundational building blocks of, of so many open source, uh, you know, projects and applications. Um, that's not who we work with. Uh, we feel like they're important. We use them. We cheer for them. Um, but that's that's not our focus. Now, if you look over at the left, um, we begin to see um, the types of projects that, that we work with. So, you know, by and large, they're applications, complete end-to-end -end applications, and they're and they're very directly focused on a so social objective, uh, which we define as the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And so when we look at a project, we're basically going to map it out and say, um, how mature is it in terms of its ability to sustain itself, maintain, make money, et cetera? Um, and then how, um, how focused is it um, explicitly on, on the SDGs? Um, and you look at the orange in the middle, that's kind of like our, our sweet spot, which we call the, you know, the Digital Public Goods Foundation, the idea of an accelerator. That, that's where we kind of put a lot of our focus. Over on the right are, are um, projects that we would care about, but they're a little bit further along. They've pretty much figured out their own sustainability, often with a partnership with an organization that can play some functions and roles around financing and activities. Uh, we also don't work in innovation, so we don't, we don't care a lot about brand new things. We think they're important, but there's so many of them come in and there's, um, you know, there's uh, hackathons and accelerators and innovation funds and all sorts of things that can bring things into the world. Um, what we really kind of focus on are those that, that, that do exist um, and are struggling. Um, so just to kind of, you know, give a, give a snapshot of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, uh, projects we're talking about, what do they do? So I'll just kind of read these off kind of, you know, quickly. And again, I encourage you to um, to take some time, uh, research them, find ways to, to connect with them. Um, you know, many of them um, have gone through the work of being able to take volunteer contributions, uh, and they're always looking to kind of grow the community. So, you know, uh, Primero um, is a, a great uh, project that, you know, we work with very, uh, very closely. Um, they work in, it works in, uh, you know, child protection, uh, social services. Um, Open MRS is uh, one of the um, you know larger digital public goods, very well known, focused on the medical records. They have a very um, you know robust uh, community uh, globally. Um, Mojo Global, for those of you who are interested in in climate change, they have an outstanding um, uh, land use uh, land management tool called Flint, uh, which is in uh, is in the Linux Foundation, um, and is a is a really outstanding uh, project if you're interested in that. Uh, MIFOS uh, focused on uh, banking, um, everything from microfinance banks to, to larger banks who are looking for a core banking system uh, built in open source. Uh, they're tied into the FINERACT program at the Apache Foundation. Uh, Mojaloop, which is a new and very exciting, very interesting. Um, if you're in, into crypto, sometimes it's a little bit interesting, but it's a payment settlement platform um, that allows for movement of money between, uh, you know, national banks and uh, mobile network operators um, with a lot of focus right now in Africa. Uh, ODK is uh, you know, very well known, used a lot for, uh, for data collection. Uh, DHIS2 is probably the largest uh, digital public good. It's been supported um, at the University of Oslo for a very long time, focused on health information. Uh, civil registration, open CRVS, really important system being developed to be able to, um, you know, so many countries don't have you know, birth records, just, just basic records. Um, so it's a system for them to be able to do that. Open LMIS, we'll take a little bit of a deeper look in that uh, as we go along, um, but they, pharmaceutical supply chain um, and MOSIP, uh, national ID. So this is just a kind of a, um, you know, snapshot of, you know, some of the projects that are out there. Um, but thinking about where these projects start, where they begin um, is very, very important because it's, different than other open source. So most open source, you know, you've heard like, you know, you scratch an itch or you start it in the garage. Um, it's, it's very often this image of, you know, one person solving their technical challenge. Um, and, then, and then others saying, oh, that's useful because it solves my challenge too. And we, and then they begin to collaborate, community starts and, and, it, and it builds um, from there. Um, this is very different because it doesn't start with a technical need. Um, and very often it doesn't start with a technical person. It starts with a social objective. It starts with a social need, um, and very often coming out of a you know a large nonprofit, they say you know we need to solve X problem, and we find that a digital tool focused on this will help us get there faster. Um, so that's where that's how these ideas start, um, and then they go out and they look for money to fund it. So this is not 
This is not the startup world. This is not VC money. It's, it's not even volunteer. It's, it's looking for large grants to be able to fund the initial development of these projects. Um, and then they start. Um, and almost always, it might seem like a strange thing, but they almost always start inside of universities and nonprofits. It might seem strange, but it, it actually makes a lot of sense because those two types of organizations, number one, are focused on social good. Number two, they are um, able to accept um, large grants and donations. Um, this is one of the things that um, is probably most important in this sector is that those who are giving uh, large amounts of international uh, money um, have very strict honor requirements uh, that most um, organizations just don't have the capability and the capacity to be able to process. Um, and so universities, large NGOs um, are able to process them. So then they start to build it, um, they put it on the market, they test it, they release it under an open source license, everything is going well. Um, a community begins to form, commercial partners say, hey, this is useful, let me build some value on top of that. It begins to grow, they don't necessarily contribute back. And then we find ourselves in the valley of death. So the valley of death is something that's, you know, a phrase is commonly used in, in startup investing, uh, et cetera. And we look at it a little bit differently. So we look at it as the point when the grant funding is beginning to dry up. Nobody wants to grant something forever. They see it as a, a initial investment, a catalyst um, for growth, um, but that grant money is not going to stay along forever. But the problem is, is, this is not a business. It's not a startup. And so there is the money doesn't follow with it. Um, very often, the initial developers are, are being paid. Because it started inside of a nonprofit, they paid an external company uh, to build it. And those ex that external company is not as invested as an open source community might be. So then we find these projects, they've run out of money. The, uh, those who have built it are not you know, active uh, contributors inside of the community. And they really, really kind of struggle uh, to meet scale. So, so what, do we, what do we do with that? So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. That's kind of the, the world that we find ourselves in. Uh, let's look at the same thing, uh, but looking at the project uh, OpenLMIS, just to give a real uh, kind of snapshot into what an organization like, like this would look like. So um, there is a need in Africa to, um, for supply chain systems to move healthcare pharmaceuticals. A lot of uh, large nonprofits are in the health space. They're having to you know, move goods to where people are. And uh, a number of organizations found that they were working on the same problem and could not find an off-the-shelf solution and were beginning to build their own. This is where their kind of first success uh, started. They said, like, instead of us each building our own, why don't we build something in common? And so, um, so a number of organizations, you know, kind of led by, you know, Rockefeller, USAID, and Gates said, hey, we're going to throw some money at this. And then others, Commonix, ThoughtWorks, Path, uh, Chai, and an organization called Village Reach said we're going to all collaborate on this together, and we're going to build you know a common tool. You know, you know, so far so good. Uh, Village Reach, an NGO based out of Seattle, uh, was able to accept funding, was able to you know pay the developers, was able to build the product, and kind of bring it out to market. Again, shared it under an open source license. Um, the community began to form. We were doing implementation, so country level implementation, several million dollars per implementation. So there, there's some value there. Um, for the for the consultants who are who are implementing it, uh, and then it very common um, is you know it's been out in the market uh, place for a little while. People are using it. Uh, time for a, for a rebuild. So there's still some money around. They come back, they rebuild it, and they release a really pretty great and outstanding product um, into the marketplace. However, um, it's not a marketplace that that has. Uh, has payers. It was not organized in the beginning to think about how would somebody pay for this. And you know, if you're coming from the open source world, even the concept of paying for something, what would they pay for? Well, there are costs, but are there the technical costs? What costs are they? Um, so OpenLMIS finds himself in this really kind of interesting place where they, they, they created a great product. It's out there in the world doing great things. They've created a very robust community, but they don't know how to sustain themselves. So that's the kind of thing we're going to look at uh, today is how do we sustain these types of projects? And again, it's the open source plus other things. And the other things can sometimes be the more costly thing and the more challenging to, uh, uh, to support. Um, so how many of these projects are, are out there? Um, the, the honest truth is we, we don't know. Um, 
you know, we um, we work uh, at the Open Source Center with about 40 of them. Um, you know, we've 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 tried to make an exhaustive list. Uh, we have 134 on that list. Um, but the real reality is is that there, there for however many there are today, um, if we can find a way to really sustain them, um, a lot more will kind of come to the table. And what I mean is, is that, uh, as we said in the beginning, there's been investments in building custom software by organizations for social change. Um, but like most custom software that's built there, it's just there, it's inside of that organization. So how do we, if we came and said like, hey, give us that, um, give us that software, Let's turn it into a, a digital public good. And then instead of you having your annual you know, cost to maintain that, you can kind of share that across other organizations. So that's something that we're actively working on. And we think it'll lead to um, you know, a much greater number of, of projects. And then we all also want to see is like how how valuable are these things? Like, you know, how how big is it? So like um, $76 million. Uh, what is that? So that's us using a method of um, looking at lines of code to see the value that's created in one, one digital public. Seventy-six million dollars. How much money did it take to kind of get it to that value? About ten million dollars. So the the donors invested about ten million dollars. Um, very close to a ten x, um, you know, increase in value because of the volunteers that have been able to come. But that's just kind of giving you a sense of of scale of of what size um, some of these projects are. Um, you know, there's a lot of different types of open source uh, projects. Um, when we're looking at and applications in our sector. Um, really kind of two main types kind of emerge, right? And, and most of us kind of understand how these are different. So the first is a single trusted vendor and the second is a, 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 like a true community uh, open source project. So in the single trusted vendor, there's, there's one organization. Um, usually it's, you know, um, figured out a way to build some value on top of it. Um, SaaS or a consultant model or some kind of model that they built on top of, of the open source. When we talk about open source business models very often they're, you know, they're, they're a trusted vendor. Um, while, you know, the software is, you know, free for anybody to pick up and build on, you know, really there's only one, there's only one real organization that's kind of setting the vision, uh, leading the government to the roadmap, et cetera. So we see a lot of that. Um, on the other side, there's community open source. So community open source um, is really what we want. Uh, we really want to have this, you know, neutral, decentralized, free, and a community that's vibrant. And and you know, maybe maybe there will be different versions of it, but you know, it, we will have this true kind of shared, common digital public good. That's that's really what we want. Um, so what's keeping um, projects uh, from doing that? And I don't think this is true just in. Um, uh, just in the international development space, I think it's it's true globally in open source. When when a business model is kind of necessary to kind of move the size of the because of the size of the project and, and the non technical things that have to happen for its success, most common in applications of infrastructure, um, a single trusted vendor is a little bit more common because they can. They can, they can have a business, a startup, they can, they can build money on top of it. And so a question we're starting to ask is, is that good? Is that okay? Or is there another way that we can find to maintain and, and sustain these core open source projects, these digital public goods, which will allow them to remain uh, community driven? And we think if we can achieve that, uh, we'll be much better off. Um, so as we know, open source is, um, uh, relies on a diverse community. It's not really, owned by one organization, entity, person, et cetera. Uh, while the intellectual property might be held, um, a community-led organization really does um, have a diverse set of stakeholders and you know, you know, common to, um, to, to sustain and their identification of, of who are these stakeholders. We use the maintainers, contributors, sustainers, and consumers um, as the different kind of players who are involved. Um, in our space, there's a couple of organizations who are playing a, a coordinating role. Um, there's not a dedicated software foundation um, for digital public goods. We think there should be one. A lot of the rest of my presentation will be the argument for one. But in the meantime, there are, um, or there's ourselves, an organization called Digital Square, which is focused on, on health and the Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, which is looking at uh, kind of building a, an alliance of, of all the digital public goods and those who are invested in uh, together. Very, very good uh, effort. 
Um, so looking back at, at us, you know, like what do we do at the, at the Open Source Center? What are we doing to try to make these projects um, stronger, uh, more sustainable? Um, so this, this is what we do. Um, when we started, we're like, they need help. So we're going to do two things. One is we're going to kind of work very deeply with some individual projects to learn as much as we can and sustain them. So consulting, advising, et cetera. We're going to um, kind of connect them into um, mentor programs. So you know, very active at, as an umbrella organization set of Google Summer of Code. That's been outstanding. You know, our projects um, who have been unable to um, kind of easily bring on volunteers after they go through the program um, are, are now able to have a, you know, start to build a volunteer community. Uh, we give small grants. Uh, so we started with a, with, a, with a fund where we could, we could give uh, grants. These grants are very kind of focused um, on identifying ways that we can help the projects kind of you know, work together, create interoperability, um, document their code, just anything to kind of make it uh, more shareable. Um, very often things that um, would be kind of a little bit lower on their priority list internally, but, but from the point of view of others who might be using it um, would be of, of high value. Um, so in the last um, three years as we've been working, uh, we've learned a lot of things by going really deep at the same time, we've been trying to take a high level view of all the kind of digital public goods that are out there. What do they universally need? And we're kind of moving those, those two things. Um, and in both, we're starting to, to coalesce on this idea of the need for a software foundation um, for digital public goods. Um, and then the question is, well, why would, I mean, there's existing fiscal sponsors out there. Uh, why wouldn't we uh, use those? Well, the answer is, you know, a lot of our projects should go join uh, those fiscal sponsors. But what we're trying to really kind of get at is to say that there's things beyond just the technical um, or just um, just the governance that are that these projects need and having an organization that can take on more of them. So we're using the word foundation for lack of a better word. There needs to be something and, and we'll get deeper into what that that something is. Um, uh, so again, this is this is this is how we work. Um, if you guys know of any kind of you know, digital public goods, we'd love to get to know them. Uh, we'd love to kind of you know, bring them on as members. Membership in the Open Source Center is very simple. Uh, it's just about getting on our mailing list, participating in our forums. Once you're kind of in, you know, we just got to, we just got to make sure that you are you know, um, you know generally fit the criteria, and you have the ability to apply to grants, um, apply to Google Summer of Code, etc. Um, so I'll show at the end, you know, ways that you can kind of get in, in, in contact with us. But one of the things that we do, um, and, and we've really uh, become a lot more systematic in how we do that, is our consulting um, for sustainability. Um, and so in that, we, we now have a workbook um, that has a number of workshops that we kind of work through that, that first kind of evaluates the project on like a maturity model uh, and then moves into uh, most of the most of the work actually has to do around um, uh, financial models. Uh, what are the different revenue streams that might be able to, to support this project? Um, can they go through this organization or how do the different community members all kind of fit together so that um, so that revenue is being generated and either volunteer contributions or money is, is able to flow back to the, the kind of core project. So, so consulting is still a you know, big part of uh, what we do at the, at the Open Source Center. Again, we, uh, we give grants. Uh, we're, we're actively raising money uh, for our grant pool. Um, so if, if anybody is interested, it, it happens to come from uh, an organization that's figuring out how do we give to open source. I think we're becoming very opinionated um, about uh, how we give money, how we prioritize uh, features and tasks and how we fund them. Uh, and then again, uh, we, we run these uh, uh, support programs uh, for projects. Um, so let's take a let's take a step back and and look at these digital public goods. And we found it's very helpful um, to kind of look at them in their different their different growth um, phases. And so you know we got the you know four main phases. You start in the idea phase, move into an innovation phase, and there's the growth, and then the mature phase. You know, and the the hardest thing to do is to move from the innovation phase into the growth phase. Idea phase is fun. That's when you just have an idea, right? Um, and you know, we, everybody loves good ideas. We come up with them. Uh, in our organization, inside of Dial, uh, we are the stewards of what's called the principles for digital development, which is kind of a set of best practice design principles um, for when you start a new kind of digital initiative that you know targets uh, you know a, a social outcome. It's a very good starting point. Make sure you start at the beginning. 
Then is the innovation phase. Um, the innovation phase um, is fun. Um, it's where you get to experiment. It's when you get to fail. That's where I say, oh, you get to fail fast. Um, let's build something. Let's try it. Let's iterate it. So if you're working in innovation, that's that's kind of, you know, it's fun and it, it's exciting. The real hard thing to do is to move something out of innovation and into growth and then into maturity. So our focus has not been on innovation. Um, we're like, get your act together, um, prove out a model, build something. Um, and there's a lot of support organizations that help in, in innovation, et cetera. We're much more focused on how do we bring something to scale? Um, and in bringing it to scale, how do we how do we create those support structures that are really kind of necessary for it to um, uh, to for it to be maintained in the long run? Um, and so more than we look at open source, sometimes we look at at, at, at big tech to say like how well, you know big tech has software and they know how to maintain it. How do they maintain it? Um, they maintain it by um, having budgets for it, by going out and having um, certifications, networks of developers. Um, we try to think of all the different things that are necessary to really keep a software project good and healthy and say, how can, how can we replicate that while, while keeping the open source core, while keeping the neutrality, but still recognizing that money and sometimes a lot of money um, has to flow through this project in order for it to really successfully accomplish its social mission. So these are the things that we're, that we're really starting to think about. Um, and for our types of projects, you know, we've kind of identified five things that we feel are really important um, for them to thrive. So it, when we work with a project, we sit down with them and they say, have, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And, and you need to um, identify how these things will get done if you want to even have the baseline for being able to thrive. So the first is a fiscal home. Um, you need to have some kind of a legal organization that can hold the IP, enter into contracts, hire people, et cetera. The fiscal sponsors that are available can, can do these things. Um, but so many organizations that, or projects that we're working with, because they started inside of that university or that, that nonprofit, that organization is wanting to, like they use the words all that, spin it off. We need, we're not a software company. We don't want to hold this long. We can't run a business. Like we can't do this stuff. We want to spin it off. And so the projects are coming to us in that, that state. So they're struggling. They need to be spun off. Their founding organization is no longer interested in them. And so we really have to identify, well, what fiscal home? Who, who will play that, that fiscal role? Um, the second is related. It's just, it, it's actually the vision that who will be the primary maintainer. We found that if, um, if there's not like, you know, somebody kind of stepping up to the plate saying like, we own this vision, we're moving towards it, we're going, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot harder. So we identify who's going to kind of, you know, lead the community governance, um, who's going to kind of, you know, develop all the systems, the tools and the processes, the community, like the, the product roadmap, et cetera. We need to identify who that's going to be. The next is a dedicated block team. Um, this is this is actually you know fairly important, um, and it, it comes with um, how these projects were started. Again, they weren't started by passionate volunteers who said, "I believe in building this," and then they stay with the project. They were very often uh, contracted out uh, to, to to companies that just did the work for hire. Um, and what ends up happening is because these projects are sometimes quite large, um, having, having developers who know the project, who are engaged in the project is very challenging. And what we found is that if you can at least um, find a way to have a small dedicated product team, maybe a community manager, an architect, some developers, just a very core team, then you could be able to unlock a whole bunch more in terms of volunteer contribution, et cetera. Um, and so that's something that we go a little bit deeper into um, than, than maybe an infrastructure open source project uh, might have that could rely on a community to be able to contribute a little bit more. The, uh, the other is uh, access to core funding. You need to know where your money is coming from. Um, and it has to be pretty reliable. Uh, and the reason is, is that governments are taking on these projects. They're saying like, I, I've got, I, I have to procure software for like, let's say my um, national ID system. And so there's a whole bunch of proprietary systems that are out there that says, yeah, we'll sell it to you and we'll support it and it's gonna cost X. And then we say, oh, there's an open source solution and it's, it's good, it's really good. How can they select that if they do not know that it's going to be sustained, that it's good, there's going to be future releases, that there's going to be support if something breaks, somebody can come and take it. 
All of those things need to be built. It's much harder in a kind of uh, community open source kind of environment to be able to do that. So, so starting with like identifying where's that money gonna come from? Um, and, and that's a challenge. It could be from revenue. It could be from organizations that have committed long-term uh, grant funding to them. And then the last is a community of practice. Um, you know, we, we should all learn from each other. Um, there's a lot of a lot of us who are building similar things. We should learn from each other. Um, here's a little bit of a kind of a you know a, a deep look into you know how we're trying to um, think about those kind of you know, core maintaining costs. Um, and so we've kind of broken down like what are the different costs that might kind of come into um, a digital public good. So the the, the top of the purple. Um, are what we call community created value. So they, these are usually like, you know, consultants or SaaS companies, anybody who's kind of using that software, building some business of it, some commercial revenue. And these can be, you know, quite big. So, so that's the, you know, most money that's gonna flow into the project is flowing to those. The challenge there is that that money doesn't flow then back to um, the core project um, if the project needs money. You know, the hope in good governance is that some money might flow back, some contributions might flow back, but what we found is that there's a lot of free riders. This is a challenge in, in markets where there might be some commercial value, but yet there's not really enough. There's just kind of a competition for, for very scarce resources. And, and the maintaining the core becomes a lot, a lot more challenging. So then, you know, down at the bottom of the slide, we, we look at, um, at the core. Um, we have something called operational support. Those are kind of like the non-technical things that are necessary just to kind of keep that thing you know, running. Uh, core maintenance is like the basic minimum technical investment we could do on a year to year just to kind of keep it up to date, building out the releases, and then above that, a feature backlog. Um, and so what we've tried to do is just say like, what's the, what's the minimum um, that we can look at? And, and why this is important is that if we can figure out how to support the core, if we can figure out how to support the minimum, we can maintain the community nature of it. They're less likely to have to revert to a single vendor, um, open source business model, et cetera. And so we're putting together this, this vision where we, we say like, you know, um, international um, donor community who has invested in these projects should continue to invest in them at, this, at, this, at least at this minimum level, because this is the minimum viable that we can really guarantee that this project will be available for governments, people can pick it up and use it, it will be supported, and we can, um, and we can build value on top of that. And, and once we have that core, if we can have a, a very robust community um, growing and scaling over time, there will be more contributions back, both in terms of money and, um, and code. Um, we'll take a little bit of look at you know, how we're doing uh, this. Um, so we actually do think that we have to put together teams. Um, they don't necessarily have to you know, be in one organization. It could be distributed and it could be made up of volunteers, but you got to identify them. You got to say there is a core team and they're really important for this project. I, um, and by having them, making sure that they are, you know, whole, maybe, and this might, might feel like it's kind of, you know, gives some of the ethos of, of, of open source and we gotta understand the challenges there, um, but there needs to be at least a core um, that is, that, that can reliably get paid each month and can contribute to the, um, to the project. There's different ways that that can happen. Um, but we're focused on just like a, a, a mini core and then everything else kind of coming out from, uh, from there. Um, so this is how we see a, a foundation kind of coming together. Um, we recognize that a lot of projects are already inside of uh, um, foundations, fiscal sponsors, um, but they need some of these other roles, these, these non-technical support roles, uh, dedicated product teams, um, the ability for somebody to kind of enter into contracts on their behalf. Um, so one of our projects um, is a member of, you know, a very well-known uh, fiscal sponsor. Um, and they have been offered, they, they have been asked by the World Bank if they can implement their, their, their software um, in, um, in uh, multiple uh, countries around the world. It's a very valuable piece of software. Um, and, you know, into projects that could be 50 to $100 million. And now imagine you're an open source project, as we understand an open source project, and now someone's coming to you and saying, we have $100 million and we want this software to be implemented in every country. But yet you don't have a network of implementers yet. You don't have commercial entities who are out building, like who will enter into those contracts? Who, who will 
and that's a lot, that's a lot of money. So, um, so this is something that we're we're starting to build out. Like we need to be able to think big. We need to be able to uh, interface with these large organizations that are making pretty um, substantial global investments. Um, we do believe that open source can be the core of that, but it, they can't just go to the open source project. That's just not the nature of it. And so what we're trying to do is, is maintain the open source nature of a project by building an organization on top of it that is that is strong enough to be able to enter into these contractual relationships while maintaining the neutrality of the core project. So that's the vision that we're, that we're working towards. Um, and um, these are a number of the things that we feel should be inside of, of that or organization. So the first is the Open Source Resource Center. Um, this is something that we've already built. Um, this is the thing that we've been running. Um, you know, we've got our, our budget up there. We think it, it, it's very, very valuable to have a support organization to do that. Uh, we do think that there needs to be some kind of a, a lab um, mostly around, you know, ideas of interoperability. We have this project and this project. How can we get them to work together? How can we go out together and uh, and build a kind of common value? Uh, we think our micro grants program is is very good um, and and can and can be a foundation um, for being able to move uh, more significant amounts of money uh, to feature development in digital public goods. But we also think that there is there's a role for multiple platforms. Um, we do think that there is a um, you know role for you know, volunteer platforms, um, for uh, you know platform for the micro grant, so we can have a you know backlog of all the the, the fundable um, uh, the, back, the backlog of you know, task lists that and and have it organized in a way that somebody can kind of find it, prioritize it, fund it. Um, even cloud infrastructure, is there a role for, for shared? Um, we'll go into a lot more detail on, on why we think that's uh, important to be able to have that shared. And the last is the ability to have managed um, core teams um, to be able to share them across projects and take advantage that way. Um, so, you know, we're going to kind of go quickly through this. If you're, if you're actually interested in, in how we're kind of imagining um, setting up a foundation like this, love for you to kind of, you know, get in contact, send us an email, uh, talk more about this um, but we really kind of we do we do see the creation of a membership organization um, probably not a c6 probably a c3 uh, or something similar is is very kind of important um, but the but but understanding that the primary members are actually those who are investing in the projects they're not the the projects themselves so unlike you know a lot of um, you know foundations who rely on corporate members we we don't have a lot of uh, corporate members but we do have is the international development community both donors and large ngos um, who may be invested in in different digital projects um, and so their um, participation in the foundation um, it would give them access to support for the the investments that they're already making and we do see that as the the foundational source of funds for this initial organization um, the digital public goods can also come in as members. We feel like most of them should come in as, as free members. Um, there's um, mo most of the projects are connected to some international donor or NGO who invested them initially. Um, so they already do kind of have a connection uh, to somebody who is a paying member, but they themselves would, would come in as free. And then for our other things, fiscal sponsor, and primary maintainer, um, just kind of budgeting for that. So we have a menu of services that these projects could access um, through through membership with us. We're also able to create essentially a, a sub foundation or account for each project, um, you know, similar to other uh, software foundations, which would allow them to raise money, have memberships, even do some revenue generating activities. Um, and these are the different things that we think that they can do. What we're working on. Uh, for each digital public good is just kind of a minimal amount. Um, we feel like you know, targeting about $500,000 a year will keep each project uh, independent. Again, these are big projects, so that might seem like a lot of money, but it really isn't given how much money kind of flows to them to begin with. Um, membership commitments will be a big part of that. We're also looking to uh, doing some advocacy for the donors to be able to find ways to give money in the long term, maybe even tying it to a percentage of uh, implementations that they're also funding. Um, but then some other revenue models for them as well, which might include consulting and SaaS versions, uh, things that you might find in a common open source business model. Um, the real trick here is, is, in, is in 
um, figuring out which things belong in a community project, which things are done by community members, which things are done by a foundation, and doing it in a way that maintains the uh, collaborative, free nature um, of, the, of the project. So um, how can you get involved? Um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, first, just uh, getting feedback on, um, on our project, um, on, on what we're doing. We'd love to hear from you. Um, there are opportunities to, to volunteer. Um, a number of the projects are, are looking for volunteers. Uh, we highly recommend the OVO uh, platform. Uh, a number of our projects are already on there. Uh, go check it out, find ways to, to contribute, volunteer. And then also um, join our join our forums. Uh, we'd love to kind of you know hear from you, hear your thoughts. If you know of projects or you are a project that you feel might be a digital public good that could be used for social good, we'd also love for to hear from you. So I'm very happy to uh, to answer any questions. Um, but that's the uh, the end of the core presentation. Thank you.